faith is in Christ and his finished work. I'm telling you, sometimes you might experience the darkest of nights. You might experience sorrow untold, pain untold, crying yourself to, uh, to sleep at night with tears. But I'm here to tell you this morning that there's nothing that the enemy of your soul cannot separate you from the Lord of your God. Amen. Hallelujah. We give you glory and honor this morning because you're worthy, Lord. We exalt you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you have your way. Have your way in the rest of this service. Have your way in this service, Lord. Speak your word, Lord. Anoint your word. Prepare every heart, Lord, every ear, every eye to receive your truth, Lord. Allow your truth to be like a firebrand, like an arrow, Lord God, on fire. Let it reach deep, deep, deep down inside of our hearts, Lord. And let it effect change like only you can do, Lord. You're the change agent, Holy Spirit. You're the one that changes us. You change our mindsets, our soul. You change our inner man, Lord God. We need you to change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hope y'all are doing good this morning. Amen. People tuned into Facebook Live. Hope y'all are doing this morning in your jammies. Hopefully you'll stay tuned in and watch the service. Amen. I'm just glad you're tuned in, if you're tuned in, whether you're in your jammies or not. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm not really clowning you. Maybe a little bit. It's all good. Praise God. We're in the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. Look, the Lord put a message on my heart. I preached on this woman a couple of times, but I don't think I've ever seen it exactly like this. So we're going to preach on this woman with the issue of blood. I've titled this morning's message, He Still Heals Issues. Amen. Amen. Let's take a look. Starting in Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. We're just going to go ahead and read the whole text. And it says right here, it says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood for twelve years, and, he, and, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, or in other words, she hadn't gotten any better, but instead she actually grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press or she came into the crowd is what we could say behind him and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway or immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself, in other words, he could feel it, that virtue or power had gone out of him, he turned about in the crowd or the press, and he said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, You see the multitude thronging or touching all over you and you say who touched me and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing but the woman fearing and trembling knowing what was done in her came and fell down before him and told him all the truth and he said unto her daughter your faith has made you whole go in peace and be whole of your plague. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just once more talk, one more time come to you in prayer this morning and pray that you, Lord God, would just simply use me as a vessel, Lord, instead that you would be the preacher and the teacher and that you would speak forth your word, Lord God, that you would ignite it, that you would anoint it, Lord God, and that you would allow it to accomplish what you've set it forth to do. That's what you said through the prophet Isaiah, that your word would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you set it forth to do. And Lord, that's what we ask for you to do this morning in Jesus' name. He still heals issues. Amen? Amen. This certain woman, she had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things. Of the physicians, had, she had spent all that she had. She had not gotten any better, but instead she actually grew worse. The word suffered there means to be sadly irritated, to be annoyed, to be tossed about as though she was on a wave-driven ocean. You know, Aaron preached for me Wednesday night. He preached on the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that he talked about was 
Sometimes we walk around with this feeling of irritation or annoyance. And we don't really understand why it is that that is going on. And the way that he equated it was is because many times we have things in our life, sin in our life, if we're still allowed to say sin in the modern church, sin in our life that the Lord's been dealing with us about. And because we're not coming clean with him and surrendering that area of our life, we're walking around and we're feeling chaos and we're feeling irritation and we're feeling an annoyance. Now, listen, she's got a physical malady. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that she is, she's suffering many things. She's feeling irritated. It's an annoyance. It's a constant reminder in her life that things aren't right. She'd been dealing with this issue and it was extremely frustrating. You know, many of you already know this, but you need to understand that this issue of blood made her unclean according to the Jewish law. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's kind of like, the leprosy of the Old Testament or yeast of the Old Testament. Those were symbolic of uncleanness. Okay. A woman today shouldn't feel that way. That, that none of that is in existence anymore. That's not the, not the case. But, but, but according to the Jewish law, it was symbolic of uncleanness connected to sin. And because of that, when a woman was dur during this period of time of her monthly cycle, she was considered unclean and she was not supposed to go near anyone else. Because then if she went near someone else, it made them unclean. And so what we really need to stop and ponder about this woman is the fact that for 12 years she's been this way. And she has not been around other people, just like a leper in, the, in these times. You know, now they, they realize that leprosy was caused by bacteria. They got medicine. You don't see leprosy anymore. They used to have a leper colony in Hanson. It was called, I think it's called Hanson, Louisiana. We had a leper hospital in Louisiana. But, I mean, the thing shut down now. We were, I don't even think I was ever able to go. I was supposed to go as a nurse anyway on like a little field trip or whatever. But... Since that time, there's, there's really no more cases of leprosy because they can treat it. But they didn't know that at the time, and it was considered an uncleanness. And they had to keep, you want to talk about social distancing, literally, they had to walk through the streets. And I know I've preached this many times, but they would have to scream, unclean, unclean, so that, they, so that people would know that they had this problem. And she had to separate herself because of this infirmity that she had inside of her life. I'm just trying to give you a picture for you to try to put yourself in her shoes, what it must have felt like. She couldn't go to church even if she wanted to go to church. She couldn't be around other people. She couldn't spend time near her family or I'm not saying that they never came and spent time with her. But if they did, they were unclean for seven days. Right. They had to quarantine themselves for seven days. They couldn't go to synagogue for, for this period of time and, and to worship the Lord. And so every, always mindful in her was the fact that I can cause uncleanness in other people. Her situation was affecting the people around her. Imagine that you're dealing with something in your life like this. She couldn't even go to the house of God. And, and the problem got just to the point where it was worsening and it began to consume her. She was miserable. She was likely, I would imagine, losing all hope because no matter how hard she tried, nothing worked. She exhausted herself of her resources. No physician could help her. And then came the hearing of faith. Hallelujah. Nothing could help her, but then came the hearing of faith. Look at verse 27. It says, when she had heard of Jesus. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? Do you still remember the day when you yes. heard of Jesus? Yes. 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 I can still remember the first time that my older sister came and told me. I'm not going to lie to you. The first time my older sister, after she got saved, told me about Jesus, I was 13 years old. I was just starting to kind of go down a path I shouldn't have been going down. I was still in bicycles and repainting them and doing all kind of weird stuff. People, people around me were starting to smoke marijuana and different things like that. I remember my, my older sister came to the house that weekend. We had never been exposed. to. Well, I might have had a friend in the eighth grade that he went to like a Jesus freak church. But other than that, I had never really been exposed to anything having to do with Protestant Christianity. And my sister came to that house and she was a different person. She was talking about Jesus. She said Jesus so many times. I'm telling you right now, I was so uncomfortable. And I'm not trying to get weird on you, but that night I can remember laying in my bed. So I didn't receive it right away. That night laying in my bed, 
I can remember that I felt so uncomfortable and irritated with all of this Jesus stuff. That you, see, I was my flesh. My carnal nature was trying to prevent me from being, to being able to receive the word of glory, from being able to receive the word of truth. See, I was still at a time at 13 years old where I kind of liked the way things were going. I didn't know any better to know what lied up ahead. I didn't know how miserable times were going to get. I didn't know what it meant to experience pain. The way that I would later experience pain. And at that point in time, I'm like, what is she doing coming up in here talking all this stuff? And I can remember laying in my bed at night. I'm not trying to get weird on you. And I'm not going to go into detail about what it means. But I remember lying in my bed at night and in this middle of this half sleep, half wakeful state. I can remember thinking in my mind, I bet she don't even love you. I bet she loves the devil. And when I said that, I'm telling you right now, it was like a 2,000 pound elephant sat on my chest. I couldn't hear nothing but ringing in my ears. My heart was beating out of my chest. My blood was, and I could not move. It's not important what that, all that is, but I could not move. And I can remember trying to think, because my mom was in the room over there, trying to say, call out for my mom, and I couldn't get any words out. And then the only thing I knew to do was to whisper the name that she had been telling me about. And I just whispered Jesus, and all of a sudden it went away. And from that day moving forward, when she'd come and get me, she'd stick cassette tapes into the into the rail on this guy named Schombach. And he'd talk about these miracles that had taken place and, and over and over again. And she just constantly talked about Jesus and the miracle working power of Jesus. And I would go to church with her and these people would beat on these tambourines and people would get up and they'd run around the church. And I really didn't know what to think. But one lonely night when I didn't have much hope left in my life, I I showed up over there at that church, hallelujah, and I heard the gospel. When I heard about Jesus, amen, hope entered my heart, hallelujah, that there was another way, that maybe there could be another day, hallelujah, but I had to come to a place of surrender. She was exhausted of all of her resources. The doctors could not help her, but when she heard of Jesus, See, Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I don't know where you are. I don't know who you know that you love that doesn't seem to be responding the way that you would hope that they would respond. But don't you quit talking about Jesus. Don't you quit praying about him because at some point in time, they're going to hear of Jesus and it's going to ring true in their hearts. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit, anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to reach in and it's going to touch them and it's going to bring healing. Amen. The scripture says she heard of Jesus. People were talking about him. Everyone was crowding around him. And in her was desperation for help. Something had to change. Hearing of him caused hope and faith to arise in her heart. And she moved towards him with the intention to touch him. And believing that when she did, she was going to be healed. She believed it. If she said it, she believed it. The scripture says, and she said, if I could touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. I'm telling you, who I don't know who she said it to. I think it was just deep down on the inside of her heart. If I could just touch him, if I could just grab a hold of him, if I could just connect myself to him, I'm going to be made whole. I don't even understand why I'm thinking this. I'm just trying to put myself in her shoes. Nothing else has worked. I've been to every doctor. I've been, I, they've tried to give me every little tonic, every tincture, every little cure that they know. Nothing is working. Why all of a sudden do I feel in my heart that if I just touch the hem of his garment, everything's going to be made good. Everything's going to be made whole. I'm going to tell you why. Because it was the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. That's, he's the one that flips the switch. He's the one that gives revelation. He and him alone is the only one that can make it so real that when it speaks to your heart, you believe if I can just touch the hem of his garment, it's going to be made all oh, good. Amen. It says in Mark 5, 30, it says, And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about him in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples thought that this was a ridiculous question to ask, right? The crowd was so thick. It would have been as if you were on the floor level of a concert. I mean, just imagine it like that. Who touched your clothes? 
I mean, come on, man. Everybody's touching your clothes. Everybody's trying to, to trying to get a piece of you. Everybody is just thronging you. The crowd is touching you. Everybody is, uh, is around you. Like people are sticking their hands through the arms of other people, and they just want to touch your clothes. And you ask who touched your clothes, but Jesus knows a touch from a touch. That's right. Everyone wants to see something new and exciting, but is everyone in that crowd really desperate for change? Or is the majority of those people happy with where they are in life? Come on, preacher's preaching to himself. And just want to be part of the crowd and sing. <clears throat> it seems like a, a cool thing to do. I mean, everybody is going to, to church nowadays, right? right? Going to this church over here, I think I'll go check it out too. She was different. She was desperate. She had to have him. Her current life wasn't going to work anymore. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? amen? That's the difference. See, there's a lot of times that people stay the same. They don't receive the touch that they're looking for from Jesus. Why? Because to be honest, they don't feel like where they are is really that bad yet. Come on, somebody. They aren't really ready to let go of what they have because they kind of like parts of it. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that some things are just worse than others. That we can sit back with our religious mindset in our head, with our stuffy little religious nose up in the air, and we can say, well, I don't smoke crack, so I'm good. But the reality of it is, is that maybe for the crackhead, they're going to get to the place more quickly where they're desperate like her. Where they've exhausted all of their resources. Where they've tried to do everything that they knew to do. And, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit in their place of desperation and destitution will say to them, If you would just hear of this man named Jesus, and if you'd press through the crowd and grab a hold of his garment, he would change you. But many times our sin isn't quite that bad. Our sin isn't really quite that bad. It's not that obvious for everybody to see. So we're just like moving along through the line in the midst of the crowd. And everything's fine, preacher. It's all good. I can put my good little face on and I can just make it through one more day. No, I'm here to tell you that that's not going to work and that that's not okay. Lord, we need you to create a desperation in us. We need you to convict us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We need you to make us hungry, Lord, for the things of God to grab a hold of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Not her. She wasn't going to be okay with business as usual. She was miserable. Something had to change. And Jesus knows the difference between the hearts and the intents of those two types of people. Again, her condition was a physical illness that caused her religious and societal separation. But spiritually, the uncleanness, once again, connects back to a sin type. And with that in mind, imagine a person bound in sin. Bound with an addiction of some sort. I'm just using an addiction right now, but it doesn't have to be that, right? Uh, some sort that plagues their mind, whatever their sin is. Because sometimes, listen, when I say addiction, you you might think of drugs or alcohol, but that's not. That don't have to be anything that keeps pulling you back. Has a demonic power behind it. So I, mean, I can remember, like, I, I know that I've shared this story before, but in the old church that I went to, there was a youth pastor there. And sometimes these youth pastors, for whatever reason, they'd come and they'd tell me, hey, guess what I preached on tonight? I remember one youth pastor, it was probably, it's not important which one it was. He came up to me, he said, guess what I preached on tonight? I'm like, what'd you preach on? Lord, forgive, you know, I'm not, I mean, this isn't a sin, what I'm going to say. He's, I preached on French kissing. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, what did, you, what did you tell them about French kissing? He said, oh, that it was okay as long as you could keep your thoughts pure. I said, dude, are you even serious for one second? Have you ever, have you ever kissed a person that wasn't your wife and your thoughts were pure? I mean, come on, bro. Like, what are you thinking about? And I told him. I'm like, come on, man. This is ridiculousness. What is going on? In, in, in the church world today, that we don't have any more sense than that. And if that's you, I know you probably ain't watching. But if you are, it is what it is. Hopefully you've grown in that, you know? Then I, had, then I had another one, and what, 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 oh, he said, he said, well, I just told him tonight, like, you won't find a scripture that says that gambling or smoking cigarettes is wrong. I said, look, dude, do you need, that's whatever, that's the problem with the church today. We're all looking for a scripture that specifically yeah. says, thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not rolleth the dice. But in reality, listen to me, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. If there's a demon spirit that's drawing you to go back to the casino after you done lost all your money and you can't pay your bills, and this thing says, you got to keep on coming, you got to keep on coming, and you can't control it, and you don't have power. 
power over it. Hello, it's called an addiction. Don't listen to the psychologist, the addictionologist that says, oh, we're going to work you through this. I'm about to get to all that in a second. But instead, the word of God says that it's sin. You might not be able to see demon spirits and fallen angels, but I'm here to tell you that they're in the spiritual realm. It's real and that they're moving on the heart of the man and trying to pull it. But Jesus, hallelujah, will set you free. She couldn't leave her problem at home and come back in later to deal with it. No, it was with her every move she'd make, every step that she'd take, and such is the bondage of sin. Yeah, you might be able to put it down for a little while, but the reality is that it's constantly there. It's a quiet, sometimes loud nagging that pervades your mind and steals your joy. In most cases, really all cases, I would think, bondages start off as what was perceived as a source of joy or fun instead of something that was going to steal from us. People wouldn't move in that direction if it didn't look like it was going to be good, right? But then as time goes by, it begins to become more like a toxic relationship that you can't get rid of. And try as you will, its persistence is powerful. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 21. I want to talk to you a little bit about the power of sin. I know we talk about that sometimes, but let's look at this scripture. It says that as sin has reigned unto death, even so my grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin has reigned. When you're talking about addictions or flesh of any type, because it doesn't even have to be an addiction. It can be a way that I keep a mindset that I think is right. I use this example sometimes. Oh, Lord, help me. Um. I used to work with this. I used to I used to have a restaurant. We had a we had a small restaurant at a at one point in time, and we had this girl, and I don't even remember her name. Lord help her, wherever she is, you know, you know who she is. She had blonde hair, and she had she had several children for a couple of different men, and you know her life was in. It, she had some chaos in her life, and she was very receptive to allow all of us to talk to her about the Bible. And I can remember giving her a ride home. I think she even, her and her family stayed in our house one time for a hurricane. And one of her kids let the little, what was it, a guinea pig out. And the dog, a guinea pig got lost. Anyway, I can remember talking to her. And one day I remember driving her home. And she was like, I just don't understand why my life is the way. And right there the Lord gave me, she said, I love God. And I always love God. But I, I, my life is such a mess. And you know what the Lord revealed to me right there? And this is specifically for women. So I'm trying to make a, I'm not picking on women. I'm just trying to make a point that this is more for women than it is for men. But what I'm trying to say is it's not like an addiction thing, but it's a fleshly thing. And it's a fleshly choice that women can make sometimes that ends up opening up a door that results in other problems in their lives. And the reason is, is that many times women, when they're left alone, feel vulnerable mm -hmm. and they're looking to find, if you will, some type of a covering. They're looking to find some type of a way that they can kind of not um, not all women. Come on now. Listen, we know that they got a lot of independent women out there. Now, look, I work for a woman that's very independent. OK, makes, you know, very strong business choices and has a very strong so I'm not trying to say all women are in the same boat don't beat up the preacher I'm trying to make a point many times women in society feel vulnerable and they have a hard time we know that people talk about it all the time that for the most part statistically most women don't make as much as men and so here she is in this situation and she keeps having children for different men but it's because there's a part to her that's trying to find a way that she can be taken care of. Well, that's a fleshly decision. That's not a spiritual decision. No matter how hard it is, the Lord wants somebody to trust in Him, to put faith in Him, to, to, to expect Him to be their provider, their protector. Amen. And whenever we make a decision like that, it opens up a door that leads to all kinds of other chaos and all kinds of other situations that take place. And it mainly because we did not have the faith that we needed at that point in time to hold on to the Lord. And so now we find ourselves in the midst of a whirlwind, in the midst of a storm, and it makes it even harder to hold on to the Lord. So then we start making other choices to try to calm the storm that create more waves and more winds in our lives. Amen. Sin hath reigned unto death. Sin is a king. See, the scripture 
personifies sin. It gives it a human-like characteristic. And the human-like characteristic that it gives it, the scripture through the Holy Ghost, is that it's like a like it's a king and it has authority and power over the life. I have to tell you that sin has power. Yes. When you're talking about addictions or flesh of any type, sin has connected to it a longing desire for more. See, I'm telling you right now, in her heart, the last thing she wanted, I'm just using her as an example, because if I don't try to find other practical examples, everybody watching on whatever, whatever video source or even in here is going to be like, oh, not me. Let me check out for a little bit. Let me go scurry with my little jammies and go get me a cup of milk because he's not talking about me right now. No, I'm talking about everybody. Yeah. Decisions that we make cause situations to take place in our life and then when we don't like where we are we try to make new decisions that cause other turmoil so and, and he's like oh well i'm not an alcoholic i'm not a drug addict so he's not talking about me and i don't have children for multiple men so he's not talking about me no i'm talking about you i'm talking about me <laughs> i remember one time a pastor said dude i just knew i wasn't supposed to do it but i bought a brand new car yesterday i'm like well, how you knew you shouldn't do it he said, because I could feel it in my heart. I could feel it wasn't right. Like, I feel, my heart was beating too fast. And I said, well, I mean, you know, she needed a new car. You bought the car. But you were right. The Holy Spirit was trying to tell you because you might have more month than you got money. <laughs> and you weren't supposed to do that. But you wanted to do that. Hey, that was a long time ago. Yeah, you ain't going to know who I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you, know you, you were supposed to listen. I did that with a timeshare. I tell that story all the time. I was in there getting ready to buy that timeshare, and all of a sudden, my heart started beating out my chest. The Lord was trying to prepare me. He was trying to warn me, don't do it. Don't sign the dotted line. But there I went like a little rat going after a trap, on, the cheese on trap. Here I go. <laughs> you know, I mean, what more can I do? I basically gave you tachycardia. What more? Same feeling that you had the night that you came, showed up in that church, and Sister Toots stopped in the middle of her message and said, The Lord wants somebody's heart here tonight. You better give your heart to Jesus. Brrr, tachycardia. You know, I went up to the altar that night. Thank God. Why I didn't listen in that stupid place in Destin, Florida that day? I don't know. I mean, I've enjoyed it since then. But, I mean, what, that wasn't really much of an investment. You know, who was I thinking? Did I think I was a millionaire or something? I don't know what I was thinking. But, anyway, it, choices that we make. You get the point that I'm trying yes. to make, right? Amen. Yes. I understand that when we're talking about something like alcohol or certain drugs, there's a physical dependence where the body will go through withdrawal symptoms and rise in great agony. But I have to tell you that no matter the bondage, drugs, alcohol, lust, gambling, wrathful anger, you might not consider anger an addiction, but can you control it or does it control you? Come on, somebody. I've seen anger issues, dude, and it'll just slowly rise and you can't shut up. I can't shut up. Like, my brain is telling me, the Holy Spirit is telling me, Matt, stop. Matt, close your mouth. Don't, Matt, don't say another word. I gotta say it, though. I gotta get the last one in. You can't have the last one. I'm gonna get my day in court. And the next thing you know, you know, it just vomited out all this stuff. And then now this other person's responding, and there's this big old major ordeal. No, that's what you call wrathful anger. Galatians chapter 5. It's a lust of the flesh. You can't control it because it's demon spirits controlling you. But you can be set free from that. Hallelujah. Nicotine. Even simple little things like lying. I can't stop. Nobody else always knows you lie, but at some point in time, I don't know about it, but I'll get to the point where I'm like, dude, I, I ain't even got my auditory functioning on right now because you're talking and every time you talk, your lips are moving. It ain't even the truth. Turns you off in one ear, out the other. When, I've not unseen lie after lie after lie. That's just how I am. Lord, forgive me. It don't make me better than nobody else, but I can't help it. I believe, I know that the Lord can set people free from lying. He can put truth in their heart. He can put truth in their mouth. Amen. And sooner or later, you're going to start to realize. See, the problem is, is that when you lie to a liar, you know, a person that has some experience lying. Or it's like a drug, a drug addict trying to lie to a, act an ex-drug addict. Come on, dude. Really, man? You're offending me, dude. I done turned you off. I'm done with this. Like, like I done been there. Who are you talking to? It doesn't make any sense. You're making me feel foolish over here. You're making me feel weird, right? Gossip. There's an addictive nature connected to these behaviors. Amen? 
talk, always talking bad about somebody. How bad. I know it's wrong. I don't want to do it no more. But God, let me just tell you what happened the other day. Can't help myself. I got to do it. Lord, please. Set us free, right? In all cases of sinful bondage, there's a spiritual aspect that is a driving force making it extremely difficult to break free. It's sin reigning like a king. Sin has reigned unto death. Let's look a little closer. Let's look at Matthew, I'm sorry, Romans 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The good part of that story is, is that what Adam caused to come into existence, Jesus broke when he died on the cross. But I want you to see what it's saying there. By one man's offense, death reigned. See, this king has a right to reign over people's lives because... The first man, Adam, willingly gave in to sin, which brought sin into the human race, almost like the introduction of a genetic defect. Can I use it like that? Can I make this illustration? At least that's the way I'd like to try to describe it. You know, there's some genetic defects that we see in medicine. Um, wide, uh, wide set eyes, low set ears, small uh, inset chin. Okay, these are facial abnormalities that are connected to certain genetic defects. What I'm saying is that there's a spiritual defect that has affected our spiritual DNA. I mean, I know that there's not really a spiritual DNA, but I'm using that to make a point, right? Whether there's a spiritual DNA or not, it comes, it, 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 there, there's bondage. And I can tell you that there's a spiritual power that is driving the person in bondage to go towards the very thing that is making their lives miserable. Miserable Humanity under the bondage of sin is just as helpless with their sin problem as she is with her bleeding problem. Yeah. She could not free her own self of this physical malady. The doctors couldn't help her. There was no medicine to help her. There was no counselor that could help her. No pastor, no priest, no father, no mother, no son, no daughter. Mark 5, 26 she had suffered many things by these physicians, but nothing was made better. Instead, it just grew worse. Instead, day after day, night after night, and year after year, she lived isolated. Undoubtedly, she experienced untold sleepless nights, wondering if and when she would ever be free. Surely she wanted freedom. How she must have longed for some normalcy in life. Can't anyone help me, please? And I just started thinking... Problems with gambling, call 1-800-TO-STOP. Problems with addiction, we can help. Problems with alcohol, call AA. You have a loved one with alcohol problems, call Al-Anon. You're a sex addict and it's destroying your life. 1-800-SEX-STOP. I mean, you can't blame a person for trying to get help, right? Man wants to help man and he will offer all types of answers to help his fellow human beings. On and on and on she tried. Please, doctor, don't you have a pill that can dry up this issue of blood that I have? I really need help. This condition is destroying my life. I've been to so many doctors already and everything is just getting worse. Nothing is getting any better. Please help me. If you can't stop the blood, can you stop the emotional turmoil that I have that's related to the blood and the social isolation that I'm experiencing? Sure, we can help. Let me teach you some guided imagery techniques. The only reason I say this is because I can remember being a 12-year-old, 13-year-old little boy. And because of my anger issues, my mama got me a psychologist appointment. Psychiatrist. <laughs> and I can remember, I was thinking, man, this is Embarrassing. I'm just telling you what I was thinking of my 13-year-old little brain. Man, this is embarrassing. Man, I mean, back then, you know, a lot of people didn't admit they were going. Nowadays, it's accepted. I mean, you can go to a counselor and people are accepting of that. But back then, that was like a stigma. You know, this dude's got to go see it. He's crazy. He's local. He cuckoo. He got to go see it. You know, I'm just telling you what they would say about you, you know. And to make matters worse, my poor mom, I'm glad she's not here. She might be watching. Mom, I love you. It wasn't your fault. You were just trying to do the best you knew how to do <laughs> I'm like, well, Mama, how do you propose that I get to baseball practice after this? Then she's like, well, I'm going to drop you. She said, I'm going to drop you off at the psychiatrist. And then I said, Mama, got baseball practice. That's okay. We're going to get you a taxi cab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, a taxi cab. I don't know. Now I wouldn't care. I'd grab a tape. Hey, taxi! 
mean? You know, no big deal. You know, I mean, we lived in Singapore, uh, you know, and we got taxes all the time, but I'm still as a kid, you know. So that's what it was. I went to this psychiatry appointment. Well, let me just tell you the quick version of the story. Afterwards, I get in the text cab. I'm like, hey, dude, can you drop me off right here on the road? No, your mom told me that I had to bring you to the state pulls down the road to the baseball field. And I'm like, dude, I get out. Hey, we on? Fat Matt the River, man. What are you doing in the taxi? I'm going to like, come up with some lie. I'm, like, I never, I'm telling you. One thing I didn't do a whole lot when I was a kid was lie. It didn't it doesn't mean after I got on messed up on stuff that I didn't lie. I'm just saying that wasn't a big problem I had. But all of a sudden, this lie came out of my mouth. I'm like, my daddy owns a taxi company. They're like, what are you lying? Your daddy don't own no taxi. That just made it worse, dude. They just clowned me even worse. And you should have, like, just fessed up the whole thing. But anyway, while I was in the psychiatry appointment, basically I remembered all this going on because I had anger issues. I was mad because my daddy, was, you know, drank. He was an alcoholic. I was mad because mom and daddy got a divorce. I was mad because my little sister always got away with stuff, or at least I felt like she did. And I felt like she was always trying to get me in trouble. I don't know if she did, but that was just sibling rivalry kind of stuff. But so, you know, Matthew's got all these problems and he needs help. So I'm in this psychiatry appointment. He sits me up in this chair. And he goes, okay. And he puts on this tape recorder. And it's got this sound of this soft gulf breeze blowing. And so that's what I'm saying. Did you just, he says, listen, can you imagine yourself on a beach with a warm gulf breeze blowing through your hair? Did you just feel that spray of salt water hit your face? That's right. You're on the beach. Just sit still and soak it in and relax and allow all of your stressors to sink into the sand. Watch them like water slowly disappear. And wake up, Gowdy. Slowly disappear <laughs> to the sand. Okay, session over. Now. The next time your urges come on you, that's what you do. You simply guide yourself to the beach, let the lust and the alcohol and the opiates and the nicotine and the meth and the crack. I'm not laughing about, about people's problems, but this is ridiculous. And the anger just slowly sink into the sand. It ain't going to work, Paul. It ain't reality. I need Jesus on the inside of me to heal me. You don't have answers, sir. Just like the doctor didn't have answers for her. There's not a pill that can fix it. There's not a couch that can heal it. I need Jesus. Well, that's not what I do, preacher. I go to a church where we integrate recovery principles with the word of God. We work a process of steps towards recovery, but we also study scripture, and I need that. I've had conversations before with people that came up to me after I preached, because you know what? Now I'm, I'm a little more careful that I don't always step on people's toes, and, but, but I still do, because I just want to tell the truth. And I can remember preaching before, and I'm like, dude, AA ain't the answer. Jesus is the answer. And I can remember, and listen to me, I've been to AA. I've been to three rehabs by the time I was 19. I'll talk about it if I want to. AA is not the answer. You need to surrender to Jesus. You need to realize you got an issue of blood. You need to realize it ain't about rehab. It's about recreation. You need to realize your old man born of Adam was born with sin as a king in his life and been telling you where to go and what to do. But hallelujah, the old man died in Christ. He was buried with Jesus. A new man has been resurrected to newness of life. You now have a divine nature implanted on the inside of you. He made a way, like the song said. The veil was ripped. You have access to the presence of God. And in his presence, there is freedom and liberty and joy. Hallelujah. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. So we go to this kind of church and we work these steps towards recovery, but we also study scripture. And that's what he said. That time I preached, hey, 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 the answer, he came up to me, he said, hey, bud, I need that too. I need Jesus and that too. I said, look, dude, I'm not over here trying to, because I mean, he was kind of a big old boy, you know, <laughs> but it is what it is. It's still the truth. And I can tell he was angry. And I said, look, man, I ain't bagging off of this. If you're sitting here and you're looking me in the eyeballs and you're telling me that you need that in addition to your Jesus, come back and talk to me in a year because it's going to happen again. And it happened again. Now, he didn't call me that time. And I'm not trying to say that from, a, from an up here and you. No, 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 no. 
Because Lord knows, but for the grace of God and for the grace of him giving me revelation, understand that. And Lord, but we're just one decision away from making our own mistakes and our own problems. That's not the point that I'm trying to make. You cannot tell me that you need Jesus and AA. You cannot in order to get free because listen to me. Jesus broke the power of sin when he died at Calvary. And the answer to your victory is Jesus. Not all these other things that mankind in the world says you got to add to. No. Now, sometimes maybe you got to take something to get through a physical withdrawal. I ain't got a problem with that. But let me tell you what I do have a problem with. You think that those things are going to help you spiritually and in your heart? No. Jesus has to break the bondage of that thing. Hallelujah. He says, man, my problems are unique. My problems are different than your problems. Hold on a second. No, that's not true. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. That's not true according to the Word of God. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to go off on a rabbit trail, but I was watching the news the other day. I really wasn't watching it. It was on in the background. and All of a sudden, I stopped. And I don't know if it was Fauci or one of these other doctors. And he's like, prayer? Prayer's not going to work for this virus. People are still going to get the virus if they go into church. I mean, they were probably mad because Trump said, tell your governor to call me or whatever. Prayer's not going to work. Listen to me, dude. <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean to be rude, but noodle head. Like, you have no, come on. You think that most Christians don't realize that there's still the possibility that we could get a virus? But don't tell me prayer doesn't work. Don't tell me that Jesus can't heal me. Don't tell me Jesus can't protect me. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're so you're Romans chapter one. Your wisdom has made you a fool. You think you're so smart. You know everything. You're gonna uh, elevate yourself above the throne of God like Satan, dude. You're not outsmarting God. Heaven. Lord help us. Please, he's asked these one nine. Your situation is not unique, is what I'm trying to say. This is what Solomon said. The thing that has been. It is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Oh, they didn't have crack cocaine back in them days. Well, guess what? I keep using crack. But my point is, they still had sin. They still had bondage. They still had sin hath reigned as a king over their life. And the same Jesus that was needed to break that ultimately is the same Jesus that's needed to break the stuff today. That's the word of the Lord. And you gotta, you and I gotta be able to believe that. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everything that you have or will ever face has already been here long before you entered this world and will be here long after you're gone, or at least into the millennial reign of Jesus. Amen. Whenever Jesus sits on the throne, we were talking about that this morning in the room before we came to prayer. By the way, you're welcome to come pray at nine o'clock in the morning on Sundays. We were talking about that. There's going to be a day, hallelujah, when Jesus is going to sit on the throne and he's going to rule and reign. And no longer will it be the spirit of Antichrist that's pervasive in the air, that's causing people to desire to sin. Instead, it'll be the spirit of the Christ. Hallelujah. The lion will eat straw. The wolf will lie with the lamb. And the child will be able to put their hand on the snake's hole. And the spirit of Christ will move up all people's hearts in mercy and grace and joy. And sorrow will be ended. Hallelujah. And we'll be able to feel the presence of God. And we will have a desire not to sin, but to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's going to be a beautiful day. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. The problem with mankind isn't just psychological or mental because society doesn't understand God. They try to explain it off by saying that the problem is psychological. Reality is that sin affects the soul and the soul is connected to the psyche. Now, I don't mean to get all deep on you, but I kind of like to get a little bit deep sometimes. <laughs> I don't even know if I got any... Any, uh, any chalk? Yeah, I got a little piece of chalk right there. If you were going to write the word soul in, in Greek, that's how you would write it. Psi, suke. All right? That's where we get our word. If you wrote it in English, you would write it like this. And this is where we get our word psyche. So if you look up the word soul in the Greek, it's going to look like this. If you wrote it in English like that, that's where we get this word. So this means soul. 
So literally, the word for your soul is connected to your psyche. Because the word itself means your emotions, your intellect, your understanding, your feelings. Your soul is who you are. Your soul makes you Josh, makes you Abriana, makes me Matt. Okay, that's why we're individuals. We're all a spirit. You're gonna, you and I will live somewhere for all eternity. Because God is a spirit, he desires those who will worship him to worship him according to spirit and in truth. Amen. Spirit, deep cries out to deep. Spirit connects to spirit. God is a spirit, man is a spirit, but we have a soul. And our soul makes us an individual. And we're encased in human flesh. One day, we're going to receive a glorified body. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Luke chapter 10, verse, verses 10. and uh, Luke, Luke chapter 10, chapter 10. Sorry. Luke 10, verse 27. I'm getting so excited about it. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I just used that scripture because I wanted to talk to you about the soul. See, mankind says it's a psychological problem. Mankind says God can't fix you. The Holy Spirit can't fix you. That's ridiculous. Prayer can't fix you. We need to work on your psyche. We need to work on your mental status. We need to fix your emotional status. And so they try all this stuff with guided imagery and medications and all this rehab. But what I'm here to tell you is that your soul is your inner being. It's part of your inner being connected to the spirit of man. That's God's work. That's God's work. He's the one that put the stamp on there that said you belong to me. Oh, yeah. Amen. That's not man's work. That's not the doctor's work. You can't fix that with a pill or a couch or a counseling session. Whenever we make decisions like I was talking about previously, whether it be through the addictions of drugs or alcohol or other decisions that we make that create chaos, we can use this woman as our example who had exhausted all of her resources with all of these doctors and was not any better, but actually things grew worse. You think that that doesn't begin to deal with the emotional status of the heart, the inside of the soul? You think that doesn't begin to deal with the, with the, begin to torment the mind and begin to cause the thinking to think in ways that it ought not think? I'm here to tell you, Jesus can heal all that. Now, one of the things that I have learned after the Lord gave me some revelation about the word of God is that that part of my life took time. There was a process. Listen, I'm still a big work in progress. You don't believe it. You can just ask the people that live closest to me. But I will tell you another thing. If they say I ain't different than I used to be, they ain't telling the truth either. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, is that all those years of, well, let's just be real. Daddy being mean and Verbally abusive. Daddy doing all that drinking and not showing up to pick me up for the little baseball game. D Daddy doing that. Mom and Daddy getting a divorce. Me turning to alcohol at a young age to try to numb the pain because I didn't know any better. I didn't know Jesus. All the years of all those decisions to do all of that, causing all that turmoil, it affected my mindset. I was very worldly in my way of thinking. I was raised by the world. Can I say it like that? I use that a lot to talk about that enculturation. I've shared that with y'all many times when I preached out of the book of Hebrews. And I talk about the fact that our family and their ways enculturate us, right? Mommy and daddy got a certain mindset and they raised you to believe a certain way. But if their way didn't line up according to the word of God, and listen to me, brothers and sisters, just because your mom and daddy went to church doesn't mean their interpretation of the scripture's right. Well, who says yours is? I, I'm just trying to tell you what, I'm, what I know to be true. You don't have to get into the word of God for yourself Amen. to find out whether I'm telling Amen. you the truth. Yes. But they got a lot of people that go to church and their whole mindset about the scriptures is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it doesn't help any. There's no healing taking place. They're just caught up in religion. Amen. I had somebody recently tell somebody that I love or, or told somebody in the past, whatever the case, you, you need to just stay away from that church, the religion of that church. And actually that church is preaching the truth. But you're so blinded by what you've been in, you don't even realize you in religion. Yeah. Some kind of hyper faith prosperity that's going to confess it till you possess it. Listen to me. You got one thing to confess. He made a way. He tore the veil when he said that it is done. He gave you access into 
into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Now, I know that that sounds right because that's the word of the Lord. Amen. But then you add all your other stuff. Oh, I got to claim this scripture. I got to quote this. I got to read this much. I got to go to this church. Can't go to that church and all this other kind of stuff. Got to integrate my 12-step recovery with my Jesus. I need this too. Lord, help us. Yes. So what I'm saying is, is that the soul and the mind has been affected by sin. We start to have mindsets that we think are right. Television tries to teach us that. Music, the music industry tries to teach us that, right? Am I just telling you the truth or am I lying to you? Family tries to teach us that. Enculturation of the family, of, of the family unit and all that stuff. Anything that's opposite of God. Worldly system trying to teach us, trying to raise us like a little child. The world's trying to raise us, competing with the word of God to try to teach us. Then we get all these mindsets and it affects our psyche. It affects our suke. It affects our soul. And one of the things that I did learn was this, <clears throat> was that after the Lord got a hold of me that night in that ballroom, I've told you all the story before how God said, you will present my word for the way that it is written, and then I will use you. Didn't have a clue what he meant. As I began to study the scripture, God, by his grace and his mercy, carried me along like a little child. And as I began to get into certain passages of scripture, I'm like, wait, hold on a second. This is what this says, but the preacher said it like this. And what he said, this ain't what was being said right here. So, I mean, I spent 12 hours a day on Saturdays with like as many books as I could have on, on my bed. 12 hours, just close the door and just stay there all, all, and just study, study, study. Oh, wait, well, if this, then that, and going back and picking up, turning over rocks and not leaving anything, I'm trying the best I could not to leave anything unturned. Right. And what I realized is, is that I had been taught the word of God improperly. I'm not trying to pick on any preacher. I'm just telling the truth. And the reason why is, is because they had been taught by their, their, pre, their preacher friend who had been taught by their preacher friend who had been taught by their preacher friend who had been, who are you? You're just some little chubby boy in South Louisiana. How do you know? Listen to me. I'm here to tell you that the word of God will set you free. And if you're sitting in a church where your preacher wants to add this to to your Jesus and tell you, oh, well, we can't always fix everything. Sometimes you got a problem that Jesus just can't fix and the Bible doesn't have all the answers. And so I got this number to this great Christian counselor who's going to mix a little bit of psychology along with some theology and it's going to help you know, sir, no, ma'am, you need to get out. And you need to fight the good fight of faith. And you need to come to the place of desperation like the woman with this issue of blood whenever everything else was exhausted and nothing else was working. But when she heard of Jesus, hallelujah, she just knew it. She said it in her heart. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be made whole. Yes, yes. There wasn't nothing going to stop that woman. I'm telling you right now, she was going to get through. And you know, another thing too, my mindset was, is that I, I, I don't think, that I really honestly, I don't think that, that I was ever really very cool. But in my mind, coolness was important. That's probably why I lied to them boys at the baseball field. <laughs> my daddy owns the taxi company. You lie. You just went to a psychiatrist appointment. And your mama made you go to baseball practice in a taxi cab. But that wasn't going to work because that's uncool. Or at least in my mindset, that was uncool. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I got to tell you that even after I got saved, immediately when I got saved, I felt like I had to tell somebody about Jesus. But how many times were there on the front end that I was like, eh, that's not cool. You know what I'm saying? I'm so grateful that when God, see, I'm about to get there. I don't even, see, God worked this out because at the end of the story, you won't see what I'm talking about. I didn't plan this. But whenever God opened my eyes to that and I began to see in the scripture and he began to liberate me in some areas of my life that I knew that I couldn't liberate myself because no doctor could help me, no pill could. You get the point? But yet God was beginning to liberate me. I began to think, dude, I don't really care if they think I'm cool anymore because guess what, brother? Guess what, sister? I got what you need. Even my dad, I was so intimidated by my dad. Some big old tough, gruff, you know, boy, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, let me tell you something, pops. I told him on the phone one day, you need to hear what I got to say. Jesus died on the cross for your sin. You need to put your faith in him and you need to grab a hold of him. He's like, well, that's what they told me at Calvary School. I'm like, well, good. You need to bow your knee to Jesus. But before, I can remember the first time I tried to talk to him about Jesus. I was like, oh, my heart was beating so fast and I could barely even get it out kind of like that night when I was in the bed. But completely different, right? Whenever the Holy Spirit 
was moving and operating in the life. Amen. I'm just trying to say that all these decisions, all this sin, it affects our mindset. But Jesus can heal that too. Yes. There comes a place, though, where we got to start letting him do that. And one of the things that I've learned is, is that that was a little bit of a longer process. That's an ongoing thing that's happening in our life where the word of God begins to renew our mind. Right. Not just reading. Oh, I'm going to renew my mind. No. As I get reinculturated by the word of God and the spirit of God, it begins to discount what the world says, it begins to discount what false religion says and it begins to show us the truth. Hallelujah. He begins to change our mindsets. He begins to heal our soul and our inner man. Amen. Amen. Real quick. Romans chapter eight, verse two. We're still talking about the sinful nature. It says for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law yes. of sin and death. It requires faith to believe what I'm about to tell you in reference to this scripture. Faith is the action required to set in motion the remedy. Just as a person opens their mouth and puts the medicine in to be swallowed so that it can dissolve and diffuse and travel to its intended target in order to produce its intended effects, so is the action of faith. The scripture teaches us that sin is a law on the earth that exerts power over people. I say that because the scripture says that I was made free from the law of sin and death. The word free means to make to make free, to set at liberty from the dominion of sin specifically is what that's talking about. The scripture says I was made free from the law of sin and death. If I'm in prison, if I'm in bondage, I'm at the mercy of and waiting for someone or something more powerful than my captor to show up. As I'm sitting in that prison cell of bondage, surely the whole time I'm imagining my freedom. I put in parentheses, I thought about, you ever, I, know, I don't know if, where I saw this. I don't know if I knew somebody that was in prison one time or whatever. But it was a letter. And it was a letter that they mailed to their loved one. And on the back of the envelope, it had a picture of a prison wall and a bird flying over it. I, can, I imagine a person like this woman with her issue of blood, but bound in sin, sitting like a captor in their prison cell, waiting for someone stronger than their captor to show up, to unlock the door and to say, hey, birdie, it's time to fly. It's time to sprout wings and fly yourself on out of here because I'm here to set you free. How she must have desired to go back to the way things were before. This is spiritual bondage. We carry it everywhere we go. We lose sleep over it. It plagues our thoughts and lives. Follows us around like a stray dog that won't go away. Until we finally get desperate enough to look to the only one that can really help us. The pill came. The doctor came. The guided imagery came. But Jesus can. Don't tell me he can't. He's done it for countless millions and he keeps doing it every day. Amen. Amen. But in order for you to get what he's offering, you have to be at the place like the inmate longing for his release. The place where you've become convinced that no one else but Jesus can help you. He's the key to set the captive free. Amen. Yes. So there's two spiritual laws in existence. The law of sin and death. The power of sin holds sway over man because of the deception of Eve and the disobedience of Adam. Allowing sin to become part of our spiritual DNA. And now Satan has the ability through acts of sin to show power over the human heart, the mind and the soul. Sin has a wage and it leads to bondage that slowly steals, kills and destroys. Its ultimate finality is the final death, which is separation from God. Yes. But Jesus paid the wages yes. of the sin debt, Hallelujah. Yes. which is death. He possessed no sin in himself. Therefore, he personally owed no debt. But it was the father's plan to allow him to be the fulfillment of the sacrificial lamb that would allow him to die in place of humanity. His sinless death produced victorious life and he resurrected in victory over the power of sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I got so much more scripture here, but I, I just feel like I've kept you here too long. I think I need to learn how and when it's time to go. But look at this, Mark chapter 5. Verse 32. Let's look at this real quick. We're going to close with this one. You ready? Verses 32 and 33. He looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him 
all the truth. I just see her so grateful, so thankful, knowing now that finally she's healed. I got to come clean with your master. It was me. And she, because see, it's a problem because now she has to admit, I just ran through this crowd with my issue of blood. I just made all these people unclean. I just touched you, Rabbi. I grabbed a hold of your clothing and I could have made you unclean. You can't make me unclean, daughter. You can't make me unclean. I'm here to bear your sin. I'm here to bear your uncleanness. I'm here to die to set you free. I felt the power rush out of me. Can you imagine the gratitude? Can you imagine the thankfulness that she must have felt after all those years of carrying that burden, all those wakeless, uh, sleepless nights, uh, uh, unable to, to shake it, and now finally in one moment, she knew it when she heard of Jesus. She said in herself, if I could just touch him, I'll be made whole. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move, Lord God, that you would operate in each and every one of our lives here this morning. Those that may have watched on video, those that were in the congregation, Lord. We know, I know that this message was for all of us, Lord God, because we're all born into the same situation. But we can be born again anew. We can be born again into a new life. Maybe somebody was watching on video. Maybe somebody was watching on Facebook. Maybe you're watching right now and you say, listen, preacher, you were talking about me. For all of my life, I've been carrying something around and I want to be free. You need to bow your knee to Jesus. You need to right now, in the name of Jesus, you need to say, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. I need you to heal me. I invite you in to my life. I believe whenever I heard the preaching, though, something was stimulating my heart to believe that what I was hearing was the truth. And so I'm asking you to come in and I believe that you did Die for my sin. I believe that you did resurrect from the dead. I'm asking you to come in to forgive me of my sin. And I'm asking you to teach me your ways. If that's you and you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you the word of God says that you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of truth. That your life will never be the same. You'll know that what I'm telling you is true. And if it happened, you need to let somebody know. Amen. Maybe somebody in here, you've been dealing with something going on in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus. We just all cry out to you, Lord God, and you see our, the turmoil, you see the chaos, you see the things that we face. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would move in each and every one of our lives, that you would give us a revelation, Lord, that you would flip the switch for us, that you would make it real, that we would understand that you and you alone are the answer, not you and something else, but you and you alone, the power of the Holy Spirit. Like the song said, you tore the veil. You made a way when you said that it is done. Lord, help us. Lord, I pray for the people in this church and the people that are watching on video or will watch ever. Lord God, that they would experience that. That they would be able to experience that presence. That they would be able to feel the healing power of Jesus. We just give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.